Hello guys. Uh, hope I'm audible and visible. So welcome back again. Uh, so today we are going to have the second session of the YouTube classes, where we will have daily around uh, 3 p.m. We'll be discussing tiny tiny topics, concepts which might be helpful for your upcoming NEET exam and also might help for your INICT as well. Fine. So yesterday what we saw was if you were a part of the discussion, we have a quick look about uh, your hemogram, the hemogram, the CBC values, uh, the scatter plot and everything, how to interpret them, right? So today's class, what you're going to see is we're going to concentrate much about your uh, electrophoresis, the procedure of electrophoresis, how I'm going to use a serum electrophoresis for diagnosis of different conditions, how I'm going to do use a hemoglobin electrophoresis for diagnosis of your hemoglobinopathies, right? So that's going to be the basic concept here. So we'll run through the concepts first, and then we will be seeing a few questions on the same basis, fine? Okay, so first of all, uh, this, if you want to enroll to any of the course of an academy, you might get an ex six months extra subscription due to your, uh, uh, your Republic Day special. You can use any code, whatever you have, or you, you can use a Pathwork Cup, fine? And these are the free tests for this week. Please use these tests judicially. I don't want you to write everything. Attempt whichever is going to be useful for you in the terms that which subject you are weak and if the tests are there, please do attempt them, fine. And by next month, we'll have a grand mock for your upcoming NEET exam, which will be free of course and it will be nationwide, fine. Okay. And we will we are having at 7 p.m. There will be special classes on pathology by me on the Unacademy app. We are going through an image sessions on Robins and hopefully we'll be completing them in a few days. Uh, tomorrow there'll be USMLE discussion and Friday there'll be an email session again, right? So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday we'll be having uh, discussions based on NEET PG or your INICT or FMG exams, fine? Okay, so let's start. So first thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the process of electrophoresis. What does exactly an electrophoresis mean? What are the equipments used to do an electrophoresis in the lab? And how I'm going to interpret it? Because there are two different types of electrophoresis. We have something called as an alkaline electrophoresis and we have something called as an acidic electrophoresis, right? Both of them might be useful for me in order to interpret the conditions, fine? So what is the purpose of electrophoresis? I can divide any protein in the body, uh, be it hemoglobin, uh, be it a serum protein, based on the molecular weight and the charge of the protein, right? The simple thing is, I'm gonna take any protein, for example, if it is hemoglobin, we will take RBCs, lyse them, and create something called as a hemolysate, right? So because hemoglobin is not readily available for electrophoresis, so I'll just go through this hemoglobin electrophoresis procedure first and slight modification will be nothing but your serum electrophoresis, right? So we'll take a total blood, uh, a good amount of blood, 5 to 10 ml of blood and we'll do something called hemolysate because I have to lyse the uh, RBCs. If I don't lyse the RBCs, I will not have hemoglobin, I'll have only RBCs, right? So once the hemolysate is formed, this is the raw material for my hemoglobin electrophoresis. This is what I'm going to put into the electrophoresis machine, which based on your positive and your negative charge and the weight, it'll move in different directions, right? So that's what I do for hemoglobin electrophoresis. On the other hand, when I'm going to do a serum electrophoresis, it's simple. I take a patient serum, uh, you take a blood, you centrifuge it, take out the serum, and then again do it into the electrophoresis machine. And you wait for some time. Again, it's going to move as per the, electro as per the charge and the weight of the protein, right? So hemoglobin electrophoresis or your serum electrophoresis, both of them, the way I am going to express them, see I said it moves, right? So there are two ways the output can be measured. You must have seen this for sure. One of them is your agaros gel. I can have a gel electrophoresis. I can have a gel medium. In the gel medium, if you see the gel medium like this, you'll have bands like this. This is one way, right? Your positive to negative charge, it moves, right? Or negative to positive charge, it moves. That's one of the ways. The second thing is, if it's computerized, what I do is I have a graph. It can be in the form of a graph as well. Most of your protein electrophoresis, serum protein electrophoresis will be in the form of graph. If you remember, uh, can any one of you tell me what is the D finding of serum protein electrophoresis in a multiple myeloma? We have one particular finding. What is the finding for multiple myeloma? We have something called as an M spike, right? So you have a spike like this. I can have electrophoresis graph like this as well. This we call as an M spike, which is suggestive of a multiple myeloma, right? So there are two types of output. One is your gel electrophoresis, which will be in the form of a band. Other one will be in the form of a graph. That can also be the output of a electrophoresis machine, right? So I'll just show you an electrophoresis, how it is, how it looks, and how we are going to do it, fine? 
So the simple thing of an electrophoresis, the entire machine, right? So what we have is an electrophoresis chamber. We have the containers for staining and de-staining the gel because this gel has to be stained because protein as such doesn't have any color. Only when the stain is added, it's going to have a color as an applicator, right? And this is your power supply, right? So what we do here is you prepare the gel. If it's an agarose gel, you prepare the gel and you keep the gel here. This is the place where I'm going to place the gel. After staining the pro gel and I'm going to add the protein. I'll show you that there are something called as wells. In the well, I add the protein and I connect them to the power source. Uh, you put the applicator inside, you connect them through the power source. Once you connect them to the power source, you'll have the positive and the negative charge and wait for some time, slowly it will move. You can actually watch them, right? Generally, we have a control if the entire, something called a DNA ladder, if the ladder is perfectly uh, reached, if I have ladder known set control here, if that is done, then my entire procedure is done. I'm going to look for, I'm going to interpret the entire gel, right? This is the simple procedure of an electrophoresis. Be it hemoglobin, be it serum, I'm going to do the same. It's gel, I'm going to interpret it like that. If it is via a graph, the same output can be interpreted by a computer, then I'll go and interpret the serum electrophoresis, fine. So this is how it looks. This is just the applicator, right? This part is what I'm, we are going to see it in detail, how it looks here. As I said, that applicator should be put in the electrophoresis for uh, the chamber where it will have the power source, the positive and the negative charge, right? So if you look at this, you have something cloth wick and you have gels, the wells. The well is where I'm going to add the sample. The sample will be added onto the well and then it will be connected to the power source, the negative and the positive charge and the protein slowly moves across the uh, gel, right? So like this, the protein is going to move again based on the weight of the charge of the protein, right? I'll show you how it exactly looks. We have a buffer solution and you can see the wells here, right? These are the wells. Wells are nothing but the same uh, gel where I have cut into some tiny, tiny uh, depressions so I can add the solution there. So whatever hemolysate I prepare or whatever serum I want to electro do an electrophoresis, I'm going to add to this. Once that's added, as per the weight, the larger fragment stays here. The low molecular protein goes more further towards the uh, positive charge, right? So your cathode and the anode, based on that, it, it's going to definitely move, right? right? So this is the simple procedure of an electrophoresis. So we know how an electrophoresis is done and we also have to know how to interpret an electrophoresis. In words like if it's in hemoglobin, first we look at hemoglobin electrophoresis. There are simple rules, we can easily diagnose hemoglobin electrophoresis. Then we look at your uh, serum protein electrophoresis as well, fine? So in a hemoglobin electrophoresis, there are actually two different types. The commonly done electrophoresis is an alkaline pH. Right? So the commonly done is an alkaline pH electrophoresis. If you have a question, this is the most common type of electrophoresis done for hemoglobin in case of thalassemia or a sickle cell anemia. I do have something called an acidic electrophoresis as well, which is done in an acid pH. Acid pH is not so perfect, uh, though it has a little bit advantage to my alkaline pH. Uh, it, uh, it's a little bit of a cumbersome procedure and I'll not be able to identify it perfectly, fine? Okay, so this is the most commonly done and the pH is around, if that question comes, it's around 8.4 to 8.5. That's the pH for an alkaline electrophoresis, around that. It should be an alkaline pH and the pH should be maintained constant. The buffer solution, what you saw in the image, maintains the pH of the solution, fine? So let's see how it looks in an alkaline electrophoresis. This is how the bands look in a normal alkaline electrophoresis, right? Cathode and an anode, this is the origin. Origin as other thing is the well. We saw the well, which we put the sample inside, that's the origin here. So based on that, and carbonic hydrogenate is moves here, hemoglobin A2 moves here, C2, E and A2 will come here, SDG, Lepor, F, A, and all these are different, different types. This can also come in the question. Keep this in mind. The fastest moving hemoglobin band in hemoglobin electrophoresis, HBH, right? This is the fastest moving band. Okay, if any question comes of fastest moving, it's gonna be the HBH band that moves the fastest, right? That's one of the important questions which might be asked in your viva if you are going to deal with or if it can come in an MCQ as well, right? So this is how it moves. This is very, very important. Like this is a control for me. So for any electrophoresis to interpret, I need to know this because no one will be able to say that by looking at a band, it is A2 or by looking at a band, it is A. This control should be there, which means if I'm, if I have to direct sickle cell anemia, I should have run a control of HBS. 
if we don't have a control no one can diagnose what is sickle cell anemia fine so control is very very important we'll just interpret it in a, in some times fine so that's your commonly done alkaline electrophoresis when you go to acidic electrophoresis have a look here the only difference in acidic electrophoresis the application point is here that's your well it can move on either directions it can move on either directions and that's the difference here why sometimes acidic electrophoresis can be a bit advantageous is i'll just go up one second See, if you see here, the S, D, and G, all of them are going to elute in the same place in alkaline electrophoresis. But on the other hand, when you do an acidic electrophoresis, S forms a unique band. So I won't have an overlap of hemoglobin S and hemoglobin D and hemoglobin G in alkaline electrophoresis. So it gives me a slight advantage in diagnosis. But on the other hand, A, A2, D, G, everything comes in the same band. So which means thalassemia diagnosis becomes difficult because A2 and A is one of the important components to pick up for thalassemia, right? So acidic is generally not done. Alkaline is much preferred and that's the most commonly done electrophoresis as well, fine? So now let's see how to interpret an electrophoresis. There are simple rules, right? So whenever we read any complicated uh, topic, it's very easy for me to diagnose in the form of time journey tools. We're just going to look at the rules of electrophoresis and let's see how we can apply them to come to a diagnosis, fine? The first rule of every electrophoresis is look for the control you have to look for control because once you look for the control as i said that without control i will not be able to diagnose anything fine the control in the sense if you have a gel electrophoresis like this i'll tell it actually just a second if i have a gel electrophoresis what happens here is you will have bands like this already preset it will be written that this hemoglobin a this hemoglobin A2, this hemoglobin S. These three are my controls. Then I'm going to compare it with the patient. The patient should be compared with the control. So the first thing for me is I have to look for the control, fine? Okay. Okay, Akshit, your question of why it's, there is a difference between the acidic and the alkaline electrophoresis. See, when the pH changes, can I say that the protein composition of any protein will change? Good afternoon, Stavi. Definitely the composition of any protein will change when the pH changes, right? So that's the reason that the molecular division also changes, the charge changes, everything changes. So it differently eludes in an alkaline and an acidic electrophoresis, right? Because you must have read about something in your biochemistry course on isoelectric pH. That's very, very important for my protein stability. So the stability differs with alkaline and acidic. So the elution also differs in alkaline and acidic, fine? Okay, great. The second rule for an hemoglobin electrophoresis is to look for your A2. Whenever you see hemoglobin A2, as a significant band. If you're going to see a significant band in hemoglobin A2, my diagnosis is going to be, I'm going to incline towards thalassemia, especially beta thalassemia, more commonly in minor, but major also might have, just to oversimplify it, I'm just saying, beta thalassemia patients, hemoglobin A2 will be prominent, right? Third one, the third rule for a hemoglobin electrophoresis, hemoglobin F. When do you think hemoglobin F will become uh, almost undetectable in an adult? During childhood, hemo uh, infancy at birth, hemoglobin F will be there. Around 6 months, hemoglobin F almost becomes like 1% or something, right? So if in an adult, after 6 months, hemoglobin F, if it is a prominent band, if you're seeing a prominent band of hemoglobin F, which means the anemia is in severe hemolytic anemia. Because whenever I'm going to have a severe hemolysis, as a protective mechanism the hemoglobin f gets overexpressed right so this is what i'm going to have the rules these are very simple rules right we're just going to apply these rules and we're going to come to a diagnosis of what type of your uh, anemia or he hemoglobinopathy in the uh, below image right i'll have this is the most commonly circulated uh, image for hemoglobin electrophoresis we'll just try to uh, see how to interpret them right so this thing for me is in control the first thing for me is a control. Based on the control, we'll try to interpret every one, uh, all other cases, right? Let's look at one. What I have marked as one is the first one, fine? So we look at one. Uh, as I said, the control, if you look at that, my hemoglobin A2 is very, very slight. Hemoglobin F is very, very slight and hemoglobin A occupies the maximum, right? So when you look at the control, which band is more than the, uh, look at the patient one, which band is more than the control? Can I say hemoglobin A2 is more than the control? Yes. If hemoglobin A2 is more than the control, what is my thought process? What do I think of? 
my A2 is a little bit more, I'm going to think of thalassemia, perfect, right? I'm going to think of beta thalassemia. So if I'm going to think of beta thalassemia here, my hemoglobin F here is the same as in control. So it's a very severe thalassemia or a trait or a carrier state. I'm going to think of a carrier state because hemoglobin F is the same, right? So this will be a beta thalassemia trait. This is going to be a beta thal trait, fine? Because A2 is there, it's not a major because hemoglobin F is almost the same amount. So it's not a severe hemolytic anemia, it's a beta thalassemia trait, got it? Fine, we look at the second image. The second patient will be able to definitely excel once we finish all the four or five here, fine? Look at the second, again I'm having more of hemoglobin A2. So again, my first thought process, I'm having some patients inclined towards thalassemia. But when I look at hemoglobin F, is it significant? It is very significant, right? Again, always you have to compare with the control only. It's very, very significant. So it's a severe thalassemia, severe hemolytic anemia, which is my beta thalassemia major. Alpha thalassemia might not have hemoglobin A2 much. We look at the few MCQs. I've kept them because A2 might differ between alpha and beta. So it's an A2 beta thalassemia and here hemoglobin F is wider. So it's a beta thalassemia major, right? Look at the next third, third image here. Again, I wanted to compare to the first image. This is my control. That's what I'm going to compare to, right? A2 is not elevated. It's same. But hemoglobin S is there. So I'm going to think something of a sickle cell anemia. F is not elevated. Hemoglobin A is also there, right? So the third patient is your sickle cell anemia or sickle cell trait. What will it fit into? It's a classical case of sickle cell plus A, right? So it's an hemoglobin AS, which is a sickle cell trait, right? So it's going to be a sickle cell trait. That's going to be the diagnosis here, right? It's not a sickle cell anemia. It's having A as well as F, very little F, which means not a severe hemolytic anemia. When you go to the fourth one, again, A2 is not there. So not a thalassemia. F is very, S is very wide. F is also wide compared to the normal. Actually, there's no HbA which means hemoglobin A is completely absent, right? The fourth one, there's no hemoglobin A at all. My hemoglobin A is completely absent. So what's happening here is, it's hemoglobin SS, which is a full-blown or a homozygous sickle cell anemia. Fine. It's a homozygous sickle cell anemia, right? So I'm sure you'll be able to interpret all the case of hemoglobin heterophoresis just with the rules. You know the rules? I'm just going to go through rules once again. The simple rules, look for the control always. If A2 is prominent, think of a thalassemia, probably in beta thalassemia. If F is prominent, think of any severe hemolytic anemia. Be it sickle cell anemia, major. Thalassemia, major. It should be in homozygous condition, fine? It's simple. I'm just going to ask you one more question. Uh, in this image, uh, we, we together diagnosed all these conditions, right? We're able to diagnose all the four different conditions here. But if you have read an MCQ, you must have read that, which is better, hemoglobin electrophoresis or HPLC? Which you think is better? If it's an MCQ, we always go for HPLC, right? HPLC is better to diagnose your hemoglobin over this than hemoglobin electrophores, right? Just going to see why HPLC is better. HPLC is your high performance liquid chromatography. We'll look at HPLC soon, maybe in uh, further sessions. I'm not going to uh, HPLC now, fine. So why is HPLC better here is, one thing HPLC is quantitative. See, when something is quantitative, it makes me much more confident, right? Quantitative in the sense, it will tell me exactly hemoglobin A2 is like 5%. 4 to 8% is the suggestion for thalassemia. In a band like this, I cannot say it's 4 or 8%. I can say band is present. But HPC will give me exact value. It will give me exact value of hemoglobin S also, like 40% or 30%, it will give me exact values of it. So when it's quantitative, obviously my interpretation, not only interpretation, the prognosis, the amount of hemoglobin S in this patient is less. So most likely they might not have a severe disease. I can prognosticate as well. So quantitative, that's first big advantage. My second big advantage here is, like I said in the first image, what you look at an alkaline electrophores, right? I'm just going to go to the, that again. See, this is what we do normally, right? It's S, D, N, G in the same region. C, E, A2 in the same region, right? This is one of the biggest problem for me. For the simple reason, keep this in mind. 
I'll go to this graph again, this image, what we saw. I'm erasing whatever we have marked here. So it's here it is written, it's A2. So what we saw in the alkaline electrophoresis was, it can be A2, it can be C, it can be E, right? So it's not just A2, I think it's predominantly A2, but it can be any one of these three because all three will elute in the same region in an electrophoresis. So can I say, this patient can be an HBC trait, is that possible? Is it possible? Because A2 will be there, C will be there, E will be there. Can this patient be an HBE trait? It's possible, right? Because I don't know it's A2. I presume it's A2, but it can be hemoglobin C trait, it can be B hemoglobin E trait. Again, slight and good amount of A, right? So that's going to be a problem for me. I might miss few cases of hemoglobin C or a hemoglobin E trait, right? So the second problem for me is, since my A2, C and E elutes in the same region, same with your S, D and G, you might miss cases, might misdiagnose, right? So again, this problem is sorted in an HPLZ because in HPLZ, everything, A2 will have a separate window. HPLZ will be in the form of a graph. So they are called as windows, like A2 will be here, C will be here, E will be here. They are perfectly separated. I won't have any con confusion. If A2 is elevated, it will come only in the A2 region only, right? So I can avoid this misdiagnosis. Just for these two reasons, HPLZ is always superior to your hemoglobin antrophosis. Fine. It's undoubtedly superior to a hemoglobin antrophosis because it will have perfect diagnosis and it's a proof for me. It's an evidence for us to go and manage the patient, right? Clear to this? Any doubts in hemoglobin antrophosis? As such, no, right? So hopefully if you are given a real life image of hemoglobin antrophosis, I will show you what we saw was just pictorial representation. I have a few questions at the end of the class. Well, I'll have real images and I want you to diagnose it, fine? I'll go to the second part of today's class. It'll take maybe an extra 10 minutes. Uh, I want you to understand about serum electrophoresis as well. The same procedure of electrophoresis. I take the serum, put in the well, connect to the um, uh, power supply, wait for some time, it automatically eludes, right? If you've seen in serial electrophoresis, you must have read them in your myelomas, right? You have a perfect, uh, this is the best example for your serial electrophoresis. You'll have an albumin, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, gamma globulin, right? That's how your hemoglobin, your serum protein electrophoresis looks, right? So this is a pictorial representation. Again, as I said that, there are two outputs. One is a gel. In a gel, it looks how it looks in the bottom. The top one is my graph. It's been extrapolated in the form of a graph. Again, I'm trying to quantitate it, fine. So if you remember, the biggest peak is always albumin. If you know the normal serum proteins, the normal serum protein is around seven to eight gram per deciliter, right? So uh, of that 3.5 to 5.5, the predominant one has to be albumin, right? So it's alpha one. In alpha one, I have many guys. It's not just alpha one antitrypsin. That's one of the important components. I have your transcotton, I have a thyroid binding globulin as well, right? All of them will elute in the alpha 1 region. In alpha 2, if you look, it's alpha 2 macroglobulin, haptoglobin, ceruloplasmin. In your beta, I have transferins and lipoproteins. Gamma is your gamma globulin, which is your immunoglobulin. It's simple antibody, simple immunoglobulin, right? I want you to remember other things as well. See, because transferin ceruloplasmins, your antitrypsins, all of them can be your acute, some of them can be your acute phase reactants also. So there might be a slight difference based on this, right? My acute inflammation can have a different way of look. Chronic inflammation can have a different serum electrophoresis. What we, we must have read till now is your multiple myeloma. I'm sure all of you know how to interpret a case of a multiple myeloma. I'm not going into multiple myeloma. I'm going to go into other different types of serum electrophoresis, how I can apply that, fine? Uh, look at this, uh, tell me what is abnormal here. I should be able to hide it. Tell me what is abnormal here in this image. Alpha 2 is more, right? First thing, interpretation for me is albumin is reduced, right? Albumin is definitely reduced. My alpha 2 is definitely elevated, right? And gamma is also slightly reduced. 
fine and beta is also slightly reduced right great okay alpha 2 is having a spike right so i'm having albumin reduction and your globulin also slight reduction right and alpha 2 is elevated it's written there it's a nephrotic syndrome i'm just going to explain why nephrotic syndrome looks like this it's a classical case of a nephrotic syndrome that's how nephrotic syndrome serum altophores looks the simple reason nephrotic syndrome will have a selective proteinuria selective and massive proteinuria of the serum proteins the one to be eliminated is albumin so definitely it's a selective proteinuria it's definitely selective because globulin is not such reduced alpha 1 is not reduced all the globulins are almost in the same amount right so when albumin is reduced what do you think the liver will do will liver try to compensate right liver will try to compensate it will increase the amount of protein synthesis when the protein synthesis in the liver increases that's what causes my alpha 2 spike fine it caused my alpha 2 spike gamma globulin also slightly is going to be maintained but albumin even in spite of liver able to replace it will not be able to do it um, see when i am having a protein losing entropathy as such uh, it will not be only albumin there are other things also will be reduced right it's uh, not only albumin will reduce and protein losing entropathy if it's very severe uh, where i'm going to be albuminuria is albumin loss is going to be predominant then it will be the same findings fine okay the simple reason being alpha 2 will have haptoglobin alpha 2 has ceruloplasmin alpha 2 have your alpha 2 macroglobin all these are proteins synthesized by the liver so obviously there will be a slight spike in your alpha 2 because of your increase in synthesis as a response to the liver due to the reduction of albumin this is how a nephrotic syndrome image looks i think this or one of the things whatever you're going to see came once in a previous year question Hopefully you will not miss it anytime more, right? Okay. Look at this here. Again, you are having a patient with a cirrhosis. In cirrhosis also, I will have a perfect albumin reduction, right? If here, if you look at this image, there is actually a slight increase in your beta and your gamma globulin, right? That's what is increased. You will have a slight of an, this is your alpha 1, alpha 2, this is your beta and gamma. Predominantly gamma increase, right? slight beta increase and predominantly gamma globulin is increased right we i i'm sure we have read about this sometime uh, when we have discussed uh, routine lectures i'll just try to recollect it i'm sure you'll be able to recollect it for sure uh, in case of an liver failure am i right in saying that uh, the patients will have uh, decreased metabolism will have decreased metabolism yes so if liver failure when there's a reduced metabolism one of the important thing is my immunoglobulins is also metabolized by the liver yes it is we read ig nephropathy the secondary cause of ig nephropathy is the ig is not able to be removed by a liver during failure right so what happens to the gamma globulin and the beta globulin is both of these are actually the in real life they are metabolized by the liver since liver is failure, there is liver cirrhosis, the metabolism is not perfect. So I am not able to remove the excess protein, so this kind of accumulates, right? So these two are not increased, it's reduced removal, so the accumulation increases, right? That's why cirrhosis has this spike, reduction in the albumin, that we know because of ascites and all, all those findings, and the gamma globulin increases because the metabolism reduces in liver failure. Liver cirrhosis, any, any cause of liver cirrhosis will have almost the same spike, right? And if you remember again, you must have also read this here uh, in your medicine. I am right in saying that in case of patients with cirrhosis, you will have an albumin globulin ratio reversal. Yes, same. My globulin is elevated, albumin is reduced. The AG ratio will reverse. That's also one of the features of cirrhosis. The reason being the same. Albumin reduction, globulin not being removed, so it increases. Fine. Okay. Next image here. See, this is a very simple and a perfect one. I am not going to talk much about it. It's self-explanatory here. The alpha 1 spike alone is almost gone. Right? So the alpha 1 spike is almost gone. That's a case, classical case of an alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. I am sure you know what is the symptom of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. You know, it's the patient will have your liver disease or it can have an, um, what's say, your uh, uh, emphysema, right? Pan is not emphysema with a liver disease. And this same amount of you're going to write is an alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Fine? next image it's an acute inflammation again as i said that 
your haptoglobin, your ceruloplasmin, everything are also acute phase reactants, right? So in acute inflammation, slight reduction in the albumin. Can you explain this? I'm sure you know this. The slight reduction in albumin, why? It's an acute inflammation, the albumin reduces. If you remember, we must have read albumin is a negative acute phase protein or an acute phase reactant, right? It's a negative acute phase reactant, so definitely albumin will be reduced. So it's a tiny reduce, but still a reduction. And your alpha 2 spike will have all the acute phase reactants or acute phase proteins that will be elevated, right? Perfect. So whatever we read will be explained here, right? I will show you chronic inflammation as well. But before showing chronic inflammation, I want you to extrapolate and say how the graph will look in a chronic inflammation. Apart from your acute phase reactors being elevated, will there be any other change in any of these in chronic inflammation? When I say chronic inflammation, what are the inflammatory cells comes to your mind? Apart from macrophages in chronic inflammation? Am I right in saying that lymphocytes plasma cells will also be elevated in chronic inflammation? Yes, they'll be elevated, right? So if lymphocytes and plasma cells are elevated in chronic inflammation. So can plasma uh, cells produce immunoglobulin? Yes. So can I say that this gamma globulin spike will be a little bit really elevated? It will be elevated, right? Okay, uh, Stuffy, ferritin is a negative or positive acute phase reactant? Ferritin is a positive acute phase reactant, right? Serum ferritin will be elevated in case of your uh, inflammation. That's why we, in anemia of chronic disease, those, those things happen. Fine. Okay. All the negative acute phase reactants will be reduced and positive things will be elevated. Okay. Great. So have a look at it. Whatever we read is correct. The same thing happens here. Chronic inflammation, my alpha 2 spike is there at the same time. The gamma globulin spike is also there. This is because of the lymphocytes. I'll try to reduce the way, uh, the speed of which I speak, okay? Also you, plasma cells, fine. This plasma cells produce your increase in immunoglobulin, right? Fine, so that's how chronic inflammations, your serum electrophoresis looks. Okay, great. What diagnosis is this? I want you to come to a diagnosis. You can look at the spikes. Albumin is perfect. Alpha 1 region is perfect. Alpha 2 is perfect. Beta is perfect. But gamma globulin is almost nil. So can you come to a single diagnosis? Though it's given here, can you come to a single diagnosis? What could be the most probable diagnosis here? Any guesses? There's a congenital disease. It's an X-linked disease. I'll give you a clue. It affects, it'll have recurrent bacterial infections. It affects a tyrosine kinase enzyme. And there'll be no lymphocytes, no plasma cells, no immunoglobulin. You must have heard that. That's how the electrophores will look for. Brutens A gamma globulinemia, right? Perfect. Fine. Your Brutens A gamma globulinemia will look like this. Almost no immunoglobulin at all. Right? Or in any case of hypogamma globulinemia. Fine. Any case of hypogamma globulinemia or an A gamma globulinemia will have the finding. CVID, which is also like Brutens, will have the same finding. We have one more deficiency called combined variable immunodeficiency. That also will have the same findings. The only difference is Brutens is in very, very early onset. CVID combined variable immunodeficiency that's explanation for CV expansion for CVID this happens in an elderly patient this will present in an elderly patient only fine so age of on, uh, onset could be a symptom but my uh, electrophoresis wise both of them will have hypo or an a gamma globulinemia only fine okay what's this this is a perfect one which all of us must have seen and you must have solved questions multiple times as well. We call this an M spike. Actually, M doesn't stand for myeloma. M stands for what you can see here. M stands for monoclonal spike, right? It's a monoclonal spike. That's what an M spike means, fine? So when I say M or a monoclonal spike, 
I just want to ask you a question. By looking at this spike, the gamma globulin spike, can I say this spike has only IgM? Is it possible to say it's only IgG or IgM? Or it could be IgG, IgM, everything to put together. With this image, can I say it is only IgM or only IgG? Is that possible? It's not possible, right? I can say gamma globulin is elevated. I'll just go up. Here also I can say gamma globulin is elevated, immunoglobulin is elevated, right? Here also I can say immunoglobulin is elevated. I will not be able to say it's IgM or IgG. It's just immunoglobulin elevation, that's all, right? So in other words, this alone is not enough for me for diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So what happens here is, this is the first step. So in case of a multiple myeloma diagnosis, I need monoclonality. It should be only one immunoglobulin. If it's more than one, my diagnosis could be infection. Infection also can have this, right? So in multiple myeloma, what we do is, we do a serum protein electrophoresis. That's a first step. If I do a serum protein electrophoresis, after that, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do something called an immunofixation. This is must. So what I'm going to do in immunofixation is, I know that in the agarose gel, this part or this band, whatever is being produced, contains only gamma globulin, right? So I will take this band alone and again run an electrophoresis. But this time, I'm not going to run for every protein. I'm going to run only for immunoglobulins, which means it will divide into G, M, A, D, Kappa, and lambda right it'll divide into different different subtypes so that's called as an immunofixation so immunofixation is absolutely essential for me to diagnose and multiple myeloma m spike will be seen apart from that i do immunofixation so how does immunofixation look as it looks like this again it's the same electrophoresis procedure only this is your serum protein sp stands for serum protein in which this is my gamma globulin it's very very thick so i know it is more it's almost the size of my albumin. You can see albumin on the top, right? So when I do this gamma globulin, again into ele ele multiple electrophoresis, I see here IgG and lambda. So can I call this monoclonal? Whatever gamma globulin was seen in that image is composed of only immunoglobulin G, which means a single immunoglobulin. So now I'll be happy to call it, it's monoclonal. Right? So both of them are required for me. I can say what type of myeloma is. It's an IgG kappa myeloma. If it's IgA myeloma, only IgA will be positive. Same for M, same for lambda and kappa. Right? G, A and M are the commonest myeloma. D and E is not generally done for immunofixation. It will be less than 1%. Very, very less will be D and E. If at all, if these three are negative, we'll do LU for D and E as well. Right? So this is immunofixation, which is very, very important for me to diagnose case of multiple myeloma. Fine. Got that? Wait. Fine. So we know about hemoglobin electrophoresis. We also know about serum immunofixation. Right? I'm just going to have three questions just to make sure we understood the concepts of electrophoresis as well as immunofixation. Fine. So let's see if you can answer. Uh, 30 seconds. Uh, do comment on the answers and then we'll see if you are correct or wrong. This came in an exam. This is a PYQ, by the way. What is this? It's fine stuffy. Now you can correct and give the correct answer. Here, albumin is completely reduced, right? Albumin is completely reduced, but I have an elevated alpha 2. Gamma is completely normal, right? See, Staphylococcus, if gamma is normal, I think you made it uh, by error, you commented B. It cannot be multiple myeloma, right? Liver cirrhosis, what happens here is, my gamma globulin will be elevated. We saw the reason, right? AG ratio and my immunoglobulin will not be destroyed. So this is also wrong. Immunodeficiency, definitely no. There's no uh, role of albumin being reduced in immunodeficiency and gamma globin will be completely absent, right? So albumin is reduced, selective proteinuria, so it's going to be a nephrotic syndrome. 
and is an elevation of alpha 2 because liver compensate and increase production right so answer is option a here which is going to be a nephrotic classical case of a nephrotic syndrome this came once in an exam i think in an aims exam if something of the similar is being asked we have seen multiple images of serum erythrophoresis please wait for some time and apply it okay let's see this is an image of an immuno fixation let's see if you can pick it up What type of myeloma is this? Perfect, great. Again, this is my serum protein electrophoresis. I have my albumin, I have my globulin. Albumin and globulin is almost equal size. So what I do is I elute it again. So the maximum band is seen for me is in IgM, IgA kappa, right? So there's an IgA kappa type of multiple myeloma. Right? I know exactly what myeloma to answer. It's an IgA kappa type of multiple myeloma. See, these are fine. These are shades, it's not a perfect band. In a patient with an IgA myeloma also, I sometimes do expect a little bit of immunoglobulin G. I cannot say it will be completely absent. So a strong band is very, very sensitive. The weak ones, please ignore them, fine? Okay, this is the last question. This is an hemoglobin electrophoresis. I want you to diagnose the patients and there's a real electrophoresis, not like the photo we saw. And this is my patient and these are my controls. I hope you are able to see the controls and come to a diagnosis. Okay. I'll push it up. Diagnosis. I'm able to see A band in the patient, right? F, actually there is no band seen in the F region. But in the S region, I'm able to see the band again, right? So this patient, perfect. This patient has hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S. So there's a sickle cell trait, right? Right? The same image what we saw, this is how a real life electrophoresis will look, right? A sickle cell trait, fine. I hope it is clear. We'll not be able to... Uh, make any mistakes here. Fine. Okay. Got it. Just for a theoretical question, see, this might not be asked. If it is asked, I want you to remember the table what I'm going to show. Which of the following conditions will have elevated HbA2? Uh, just give a random guess. I know it's a difficult one, but just give a random guess. Let's see how good your guess is. A, B, C, D, anything? I'll tell the answer. Uh, hemoglobin A2 levels, one thing is going to be elevated is your beta thalassemia. Here, I don't have a case of beta thalassemia. So, HPH disease, it will not be elevated. It will be reduced. It will be reduced. It will be reduced. In megaloblastic anemia, it will be elevated, right? It's, it's a, it's, I know it's a new question. If anything comes in your exam, apart from your thalassemia, beta thalassemia, Keep this in mind, this might help you. Increased hemoglobin A to be seen in megaloblastic anemia, sickle cell with alpha tal, a routine alpha beta or an HBH will have a reduced hemoglobin A2. Keep that in mind. This is one of the important confounding factor. If a patient has both uh, iron deficiency anemia and your beta thalassemia, it's going to be extremely difficult for me to apply hemoglobin electrophoresis. Ideally, I have to correct iron deficiency anemia, make sure it becomes normal. Only then do an HPLC or an hemoglobin electrophoresis because in confounding factor. That alone is important. If I that I want every doctor who is going to investigate and know. Iron deficiency anemia should be corrected, only then electrophoresis should be done. Megaloblastic anemia should be corrected, only then it should be done. Thyroid things should be corrected, only then it should be done. Because these three are common confounding factors. Any problem in these three should be corrected, only then please do an electrophoresis. Otherwise, you'll have false positive or a false negative disease. Fine. If at all it comes, this might help you. Okay, fine. And that's it for today. We'll end the session for today here. 
uh, tomorrow at 3 pm uh, we'll try to look at some more topics uh, i wanted to discuss on screening tests seen in hematology hopefully we'll do that tomorrow at 3 pm again on youtube and tomorrow at 7 pm we'll be discussing some usml league type questions in the an academy app if you are free and if you are, have nothing to do you can come and learn more MLE type of questions fine right? any doubts in today's class if so let me know otherwise we'll call it a day thank you thank you for your time bye, -bye.